we're going to bring the supply curve and the demand curve together on the same graph. So there's some, a few definitions that you need to know first. The first one is a market. A market is any place that brings buyers and sellers together. So you're very familiar with markets. You go to the grocery store, you're the buyer, the grocery store is the seller. If you're looking for a job, you are the seller of labor and the business that hires you is the demander for labor. So we have a market that brings buyers and sellers together. Now we also, in our discussion about the demand and supply model, have a key assumption and we're assuming that our market is competitive. Competitive markets mean that there are many buyers and sellers in the market engaging in transactions. So a demander is a buyer and a supplier is a seller. We're going to talk about something called equilibrium. Equilibrium is where the quantity demanded is exactly equal to the quantity supplied. And this is important because equilibrium helps us find the market price or the equilibrium price and the equilibrium quantity. How much should be put into the market and at what price will it sell? So we're also going to talk about how market forces the price towards an equilibrium. The importance of price is that pricing decides who gets what. If you can afford the product, you get it. If you don't, you don't get it. And so the market is the, the decider in terms of our, our key economic questions about what to produce, how to produce it, and for whom we produce that product. Finally, we're going to talk about surpluses in the market and shortages in the market. All right, so we're going to start with our demand schedule and our supply schedule. So over here, I've listed the prices that we were talking about and our market demand for ice cream. So our price and our market demand for ice cream is our demand schedule. So let's first draw out the demand schedule. And we're gonna draw a curve. Okay, so remember, price is on the y-axis, quantity of ice cream cones is on the x-axis. Now, I want to encourage you to do this on your paper by hand so you reinforce your graphing skills if you are having, you know, some, some difficulties with that. So here we have at a price of $1, 10 ice cream cones are demanded. Okay. At a price of $2, eight ice cream cones. At a price of $3, six ice cream cones are demanded. At a price of $4, so I always put these little dots just to, so I can guide myself. If you have graphing paper, that's even better. Um, at a price of $4, four units are demanded. And at a price of $5, so I go out five little dots, and two units are demanded. Okay, so if I connect these dots, I have my market demand curve. Okay, then I'm going to graph the supply curve. So I'm going to go over here and I'm going to ignore this part. I'm going to ignore the demand curve for right now. And I'm just going to look at market supply, quantity supply, and the different price points. So, at a price of a dollar, zero supply because um, businesses don't want to sell if they're only going to get a dollar for that ice cream. 
But if the price goes up to $2, they are going to supply four ice cream cones into the market. So that becomes our second dot. So if the price goes up to $3, they're going to supply six ice cream cones into the market. And that becomes our third dot. Okay, note that quantity supplied equals quantity demanded at this point. So that means that this is our equilibrium point. Let's continue with the supply curve. At a price of $4, eight ice cream cones are demanded. And at a price of $5, 10 ice cream cones. So this is our supply curve. The point where the quantity supplied and the quantity demanded intersect is our equilibrium. So we call this point right here equilibrium. And this is where your quantity supplied equals your quantity demanded. The importance of this point is that now we know how many ice cream cones would be put into the market and at what price? How do we know this? Well, if we draw a line right from equilibrium to the horizontal uh, line to the graph, we can see that there's going to be six ice cream cones in the market that are going to be demanded and sold. And if we go across this way, the price that they are going to sell at is $3. Okay. So that tells us price is going to equal $3. And we're going to put PE, meaning equilibrium price, equals $3. And QE equals six ice cream cones. So anytime you hear the term market price or market quantity, what, that, what, what the term market price means is that's how much you have to pay for, have to pay when you go to buy an ice cream. That's the price of the product, okay? Market quantity means how much is actually out there in the market. A competitive market with many buyers and sellers Prices will always converge towards an equilibrium. Why is that? Well, let's say that sellers really like this $5 price. And at $5, they're willing to put 10 ice cream cones out into the market. So at $5, they're willing to be, they're willing to be producing 10 units of ice cream, 10 ice cream cones. But at a price of $5, they're only gonna sell two because people are saying that is just way too much. So how do they get rid of their ice cream? It's going to melt, it's going to go bad, they have to get rid of it. What do they do? Well, what do all stores do when they wanna get rid of, of the product and the inventory they have? They lower the price, they have a sale. So. Suppliers will lower their price from $5 to $4 in hopes of selling more ice cream. Well, at $4, quantity demanded is four units. At $4, quantity supplied is eight units. Well, we're gonna have a movement along this curve because the price went down, but we're still gonna have too much being produced, okay? So suppliers to get rid of this they're gonna lower their price some more and buyers are going to buy the product at a lower price. Okay. What if we look at it from the other angle? What if the price is too low? What happens? Well, at a price of $1, quantity demanded is 10, but quantity supplied is zero. So definitely we have a shortage. Um, what about at a price of two dollars quantity demanded is eight units quantity supplied is four units so at a price of two dollars i'm going to take two dollars and do your little hash lines over to four units 
along our supply curve, four units are supplied, when the two dollars, how many units are demanded? Eight units. So we have what is called a shortage. There's too much demand at that low price. Okay, so this is called a shortage. And what will happen is suppliers will increase their price and they say, well, if you pay me more buyers for this product, then I can supply more into the, into the market. As the price goes up, well, what happens? As the price goes from $2 to $3, suppliers produce more product, but only six people can buy the ice cream. Okay. So in this way, the market is going to clear, okay? Either by increasing prices upward when there is a shortage or pushing prices down when there is a surplus. We say that this is the rationing function of price And it helps us answer some of those basic questions of what do we produce, how do we produce it, and for whom. And in this case, we're producing ice cream, we're going to produce it in the most efficient manner possible, and who's going to get it? Those who are willing and able to pay $3 for this ice cream cone, they're the ones who will receive it. If you don't have enough money, if you don't have $3, you don't get the ice cream. If you do have $3, you get the ice cream. And that's how the market system works. The market will decide who gets what. The market will decide what gets produced. We know that equilibrium occurs where quantity supply equals quantity demanded, and that gives us equilibrium. So if you have a chart, demand schedules and supply schedules, and you need to figure out shortages or surpluses, this is how to do it. We're gonna take quantity supplied minus quantity demanded. So at a price of a dollar, quantity supplied is zero. And we're going to subtract quantity demanded. And that's going to give us a negative 10. What does that tell us? That at a price of a dollar, quantity supplied is zero, quantity demanded is 10, and we have a shortage of 10 units, 10 ice cream cones. This minus sign means a shortage. Let's do it for price of $2. Quantity supplied at $2 is four ice cream cones. And we're gonna take away how much is demanded when the price is $2. So demand at $2 is eight ice cream cones. So if we subtract out eight ice cream cones, that's gonna give us a negative four. That tells us our shortage, we're short four ice cream cones. At a price of $3, quantity supplied is six and quantity demanded is six. So six minus six gives us zero. That tells us that we are at equilibrium. If the price goes up to $4, quantity supplied is eight, and quantity demanded is four. So eight minus four gives us four ice cream cones of a surplus. Okay, so we have a surplus. And if the price goes up to $5, 10 ice cream cones are supplied and two are demanded. So we have 10 minus two equals eight ice cream cones, extra or surplus. So this is how you would figure out surplus and shortage. If recall that the equilibrium price is a price agreement between sellers and buyers in a perfectly competitive market. It's how the market decides who gets what. But sometimes that might not seem very fair. Sometimes there might be people, a lot of people out here who want 
the product, in this case ice cream cones, but can't get it because they don't have enough money. This model you can take and apply to a number of other um, services and products in our economy. For example, healthcare. Healthcare insurance has a certain price tag. Not everybody can afford it. It is a situation that is unfair. The market does lead to unfair outcomes. And sometimes government comes in to try to correct those outcomes. Uh, perhaps the concern is that wages are too low and government might come in and set a minimum wage. Anytime there's an interference in the market activity that leads to result, a result that is less than equilibrium, okay, we're going to create distortions in the market. We will create shortages and we will create surpluses. So the first thing I want to talk to you about is something called a price floor. So we'll go back to our ice cream example for simplicity, but price floors occur specifically with the minimum wage where the government comes in and says, 7.25 is too low of a minimum wage, we're gonna increase it to perhaps $15 an hour. What might happen? But to illustrate what happens with the price floor, I'm going to use our ice cream example. Let's say that suppliers of ice cream are saying, we can't supply six ice cream cones at $3. We really need to have a price floor. So a price floor is a price that is over the equilibrium. Okay? To be effective, it must be over the equilibrium. So let's say that the mayor of the city decides to come in and say that the price of ice cream cannot be lower than $4. In this sense, we have created a floor, okay? It means the price cannot go below this amount. So what does, why? Because at $4, as we saw, consumers or demanders are only willing to buy four ice cream cones. At $4, suppliers are willing to supply eight. And we already know that we're going to have a surplus. And the problem with the price floor is that now, if we have a higher price, number one, suppliers are allocating their resources to the production of ice cream because they're getting a higher price for it. That's a misallocation of resources. They should be allocating their resources somewhere else because the demanders are not demanding it at the price of $4. Demanders are looking for something else, a substitute product, for example that might take the place of ice cream. So we have what's called a surplus. And again, how we figure out a surplus is quantity supplied minus quantity demanded. Now, we also have another market distortion called a price ceiling. Okay? And a price ceiling is set below the equilibrium. We talk about price ceilings, which is another way to um, keep prices in check or under control. Again, with our ice cream example, let's assume that demanders say, it's 100 degrees out here, $3 for an ice cream cone is too much, we're gonna go to City Hall and we're gonna ask them to, to impose a price ceiling. And then City Hall says, yes, we're going to tell all of the ice cream suppliers out there, you cannot charge more than $2 for the ice cream. So in this sense, we have created a ceiling, meaning that the price cannot go above $2. Examples of price ceilings are rent controls, um, anti-gouging price uh, laws. Um, there are other, many other, in other countries, there are price ceilings on how much businesses can charge for bread, how much they can charge for gasoline, how much they can charge for soap and soft drinks. So price ceilings are typically not very good for an economy.
But in this example, look what happens. When the price ceiling goes into effect that says that we cannot charge more than $2, what we have created is a shortage. And this is very burdensome for demanders. Although it would seem like $2 is a good price, there's not enough supply. So we have a demand for eight ice cream cones, and people are out there looking for the ice cream cones being sold at $2, while there's only four being sold at $2. So there's a shortage, and demanders are wasting their time and their energy trying to find the product that is only $2. And suppliers, of course, what do they do? They say, well, if I'm only gonna get $2 for ice cream, I'm going to take all of my equipment and I'm going to produce something else that's going to get me more money. So both ceilings and floors create market distortions. A ceiling is going to create a shortage and remember that a floor is going to create a surplus or too much. Okay. And these are things that are imposed by a government body, but they create inefficiencies in the free market.